Yeah. Yeah, my Vancouver is more like Kentucky. Um, I don't know what the like Belgian equivalent of Kentucky is. I'm sure you have one, right? Where is it? Alfs. Did I say that right? I must have, because y'all laughed. Yeah, so where I'm from is like Alfs. I couldn't tell you if that's true, but let's just go with it. Um, yeah, okay, so I, I like Patrick. You like submit your talk thing in advance, you know? And I was like, you know what would be cool is we should do like a survey of all the cool new stuff that's happening. And I wrote that talk and it was pretty good, but then I realized that I didn't want to give it. So, um, so this is ChatGPT generating the slide for the talk I was gonna give, which is what's new and cool. I am gonna talk about new and cool stuff, um, but not this way. So basically a couple things happen. There's no slides either, so you're just gonna sort of get my notes. Um, because when I was showing people the talk, they were like, just do it this way, it's so fun. So if it's not, you can blame people who work for me. Um, okay, so this isn't actually the talk that I wanted to give. Uh, I was gonna give this talk that talked about DevOps, and it was like, hey, we need a second wave of cool new DevOps tools, which I do believe we do need. But I realized as I put the talk together that the DevOps part was boring. Like, talking about DevOps wasn't actually what I cared about, and it wasn't the point that I wanted to get across to you anyway. What I really wanted to do was talk about art. Um, and so I want to spend the next 50 minutes talking to you about technology, but through the lens of art. Um, because over the years, what I have done mostly is build technology products. I build new stuff. I, I built Chef. I built Habitat. Uh, I built some other things in the middle. Uh, and now I'm building System Initiative. And I've kind of come to believe that the delta between art and science isn't as strong as I believed that it was. Like, I felt like I was taught that there was this real strong line between the arts and doing art and thinking about art and then science and they weren't the same and they didn't get to hang out together. Um, and it turns out that the Greeks actually super agreed with me. They have this phrase called techne. Um, techne basically means, uh, you know, art that is practical. So if you think about the, the art of practical things or the creation of stuff, Aristotle talked about this as a, a state involving true reason concerned with production, which sounds really fucking highfalutin. Um, but essentially, it's the root of the word technology. And so when they thought about technology, what they were thinking about was art that went into stuff that you use. Um, and for me, uh, most of the time in the last 20 years, I feel like that's really what I've been doing, is I've been sort of exploring what it's like to, to think about and build art. Um, and the longer I do it and the more I focus in on it, the more I believe that the first step in doing, building something really cool is that it has to be kind of amazing, uh, first for yourself. So you have to look at it and be like, I love this thing, for whatever the reason is that you love it. Like, whatever the thing is that you like, it has, you have to really want it. Then secondarily, it has to be amazing for the audience. So, you know, you can make art just for yourself that no one ever sees, but I like building things that you see, right? I like to give them to you and have you play with it and see if it's good, right? But if I want you to like it, the best way to make you like it is for me to like it, right? If I try to please you, I'm probably gonna get it wrong, right? Because you like stuff I don't like. Um, and I don't really know what's in your brain. So a key part of deciding to make something that you love is looking at other things people have made and loving those things, right? So if you just hang out, I love heavy metal, although I'm wearing, I think, an Allman Brothers shirt, so you wouldn't know it right this second. But you know, if you love something and you don't take in new inputs, I have some friends who also love heavy metal, but what they really mean is they love Metallica. <laughs> and that's like what they love. And that's awesome, Metallica's cool. But they don't love like the rest of heavy metal, right? They're like, grindcore's too loud. And I'm like, no, I fucking like grindcore too. You know, like I want the whole thing. I want, give me like black metal from Norway, in a, some tiny town with like a kid in an ice box. And I'm like, fuck yeah, you know? Because I like it, right? And so I'm taking in this art and I'm pulling it in and, and you're then basically pulling that in and you're in conversation with other things, right? That stuff's in conversation with other heavy metal, it's in conversation with other black metal, it's in conversation with other things. The same's true for us in the technology that we build, right? We're constantly in conversation with the technology that came before, with, uh, with the things we're building now and what we're thinking about in the future. And nowhere more than here uh, do I feel like that's true. I love coming here because here in Ghent at Config Management Camp, this is like the most 
Uh, I'm going to use the word safe. I don't know if that's the right one, but it's the place where I feel most at home with the people who I think are most likely to like the shit I like. Yeah. And so what I really want to do is hang out with you and talk about technology I love as art, because then I want to hang out for the next three days and just talk to all of you about the stuff you love and why you love it. Um, because that's going to inspire me to go make better art. And then hopefully it inspires you to go build your own art and to make the things you think is cool cooler. Uh, and I hope that that's what happens. So that's why we're talking about art today. So I'm going to talk about three things. Um, I'm going to talk about Wing, which you're also going to hear about tomorrow. So sorry for the doubling up, but I didn't know uh, when we started. I'm going to talk about ChatGPT, which you also heard about earlier, but uh, from a slightly different angle. And I'm, of course, going to talk about system initiative. Um, I'm going to talk about what makes them fun, I'm going to talk about what makes them in helpful, what, what to me makes them inspiring, um, and then I want to talk to you. So let's go. Let's talk about Wing. So what's Wing? It's a programming language for the cloud. This is our website. That's what they describe it as. So it combines infrastructure, runtimes, and code into one language, uh, enabling people to stay in their creative flow and to deliver better software faster and more securely. Wing's mostly open source, I think. Uh, it does look like it's mostly open source. There's some parts that aren't. It's unclear to me which ones are open source and which ones aren't, so we should ask him tomorrow. Um, prior art for Wing. You know, the first person I ever heard talk about Wing was actually Joe from Pulumi. Uh, I met Joe before Pulumi was a thing you knew about. We were like having dinner with venture capitalists, and Joe basically pitched Wing to me as Pulumi. And I was like, that sounds pretty cool. So to me, Joe is the earliest prior art for this that I ever heard. Um, but the thing that you most commonly will think about is the serverless framework. Um, if you've ever used the serverless framework, basically you write a bunch of little functions and then you glue them together with some YAML and then you run them. And that's like the most direct ancestor to Wing, right? So what's it like to use Wing? Well, first off, Wing's a programming language, so what you're really doing is writing code. Um, it thinks about this idea of like the cloud as runtime. So if you look up there, it says like bring cloud and bring util, and then we're creating buckets and counters and queues, right? All that stuff uh, is you know cloud as runtime. It's thinking about you know these abstractions that we're going to use, which then eventually become infrastructure. And then we have this function we call queue set consumer, and that has a little in-flight tag on it, right? And what that means is we're going to run that code at runtime, right? So it's going to like set up a bunch of stuff from the cloud make your queues together, and then when it wants to run the function, it's going to run this little counter. And what it's going to do is every message that comes in, it increments a counter, then it puts it into a bucket, then it logs some output, right? And then we can write a little test and be like, hey, does this actually do what I thought it would do? So an interesting thing to think about here is that there's this split between pre-flight and in-flight. So they think about the code, most of the code here is pre-flight code, which means when the compiler runs it, it's going to take it, and then it's going to turn that into infrastructure. And then the in-flight part is the function that's actually running when you're doing whatever you're going to do. Right? So there's this interesting split there. We'll talk about that again in a minute. But there's really no infrastructure description here at all, right? um, other than queue right? uh, or, or bucket. Right? But you don't really, it doesn't look like infrastructure as code. You're not describing infrastructure really at all. Um, you just kind of focus in on the behavior. So then what you do is you run this thing in a simulator. And when you do that, you run this command that's called wing it. <laughs> yeah? Fuck yeah, wing it, right? I'm the guy who brought you knife, recipes, right? I love that shit. This is like my jam. So as soon as I got to wing it, I felt like this little dog. I was like, yes, this was made by people like me. They love you in their hearts. Um, it was awesome. So then wing it pulls up this pretty rad simulator, right? So how's this thing work? Well, it takes all that code you wrote and it puts it into a simulator and then it's all running on your laptop. So there's no actual cloud involved, but I can click around on this thing and interact with it directly. So I wrote all this code that's like, hey, make me a message queue with a consumer in it. I can like put it in the little box. I can type in my message. I can hit the button and it'll actually push the message through the system. I can then click on the next thing, the little message store, right? And then I can inspect it. And it's got a list of files that it wrote out, right? And then it's got a little message. Hello, configuration management camp. It's the best, right? And it gives us the raw data back. This is rad, right? This is fucking cool. 
Who doesn't want a little simulator that has all your business logic in it? You can just click around in it. You can change it. You can be like, oh, I don't like the way the file names are written. And then you can tweak it, and it'll hot reload it, and then you can do it again, and it's got a new file with a new name. That's fucking cool. It doesn't work that way if you use some other thing, right? It's cool. So then you're like, hey, that's rad. You can manually mess around with this thing. But I am a professional software developer. I need tests. And they thought of that for you too. So they take that little test I wrote before, they throw it in a little panel, I can hit the little button, and what it'll do is not mess with the local state of the simulator. This is genius. I know it, it, it seems dumb, but if you think about it, I can go tweak this thing, I can play with it manually. Every time I run a test, it runs it in isolation. It's just a little bit of sweetness. It's just a little goodness on it that like, makes it even better. So you can run the test, it'll tell you if it worked. That's super rad. Look, this feedback loop is incredibly good. If you've ever used any of the existing serverless tools, let's just call it awful between friends, right? We're all friends. Hi, live stream. It's not good, right? It's no fun. This thing's fun. It's fantastic. It's super nice. Night and day better. Night and day compared to the other ways you could possibly do this. It's so much better. Um, OK, so then you're like, hey, the simulator's rad. How do I deploy this thing to production? Well, at deploy time, you generate infrastructure as code. So you say wing compile, and then you pass in a platform. And the platform is like a tuple of the infrastructure backend you want to run and the cloud provider you want to deploy it to, right? So you say Terraform and AWS, or Terraform and Google, or whatever. And then what it does is spit out infrastructure as code, right? So this is a Terraform repository. They spit it out in JSON rather than HCL. That kind of bummed me out, because I feel like if you just gave me a ball of JSON, that just, I don't know. I don't know why it felt like a cop-out, but it did. But I get JSON, right? It sticks one half dozen to the other. What's cool about the JSON it generates is all the glue you don't want to have to think about, it did. So it thinks about things like IAM rules, right? It knows that I'm building you a database table, and it knows that database table needs to talk to the queue. And so it sets up all the rules to make all that stuff happen for you. You don't have to think about it. I love it. I love the inferred infrastructure part. That part, great. So cool. Look, what's Wing? Wing is great. Wing's awesome. It focuses in on the developer experience that you want. It solves that horrible feedback loop that lives in the serverless space. There's a ton of inspiration that we should all draw from Wing, right? So cool. Um, I can dig it, as the Fonz would say. OK. What else do we need to know? So what are the sharp edges? It's not all good, right? Something's got to be terrifying. So you know, Wing's very abstract. If you think about it, most of your applications actually do care about the specific behavior of the stuff you choose. You don't really choose queues. You choose NATs. You choose RabbitMQ. You choose SQS. And you care because you're picking individual properties of those queues. So I have some suspicions about like queue, right? Are we going to have database? We're going to bring database? Is that going to work? I don't know. Maybe if you're small, but not if it matters. Um, extending the platform. To do this, you kind of have to be an expert in the Wing abstract programming style. So you have to know that I want a developer to have this abstraction that is queues. Then you also have to be an expert in infrastructure as code, because you're going to have to write a compiler backend that understands how to go from the abstract to the concrete, um, which, I mean, is totally doable, right? It's not like that's not a thing we can do. But let's just say it's harder um, than maybe other things we might need to do. And then finally, troubleshooting and collaboration and release planning. There's a lot of like day two shenanigans that happen when we're like, running real life applications. And this is a pretty complex deployment pipeline. You, you're going to review the application logic. You're also going to review the generated code. Then you're going to look at the plan for how that would apply across the other thing. That's going to be different depending on the back end you chose. Look, this complexity, this part's mostly because of how infrastructure as code works. I don't think it's Wing's fault. I think it's just that's how infrastructure as code rolls. And so you're just sort of stuck with it. Um, if you think Wing's interesting, what other things could you look at that are also interesting? So one is this crowd of things that I just I, I think of them as the annotations crowd. So there's a set of people who are like, hey, you know what we should do? We should decorate our programming languages with infrastructure. So Shuttle is a good example of this. There's some code here that says, hey, I need a database. And so you, end, you just put a little fucking annotation in there, and then it poops one out for you. Um, Clotho is another one. They're like, hey, I want my map to be persisted in some store. What store? I don't know. But it is going to do it. Um, so if you think it's cool, you could look at the annotations crowd. Another crowd with the same basic idea, which is we need a cloud programming language, are the language-specific passes. 
So you can see this with like Deno, Vercel, other people. Deno is the best example because essentially they're saying, hey, look, we build a, a runtime for TypeScript. What we're going to do is add services to our runtime like key value stores and queues and cron jobs and all the things that you want to do in this abstract programming language. So then instead of thinking about infrastructure at all, you're just going to use our key value store to implement what you want. Then you don't have to think about it. No infrastructure is code. It just works. So what other directions could we go? So what kind of cool art could we think of beyond here? So one is this pre-flight, in-flight split. I did this to you with Chef. How many people use Chef? Remember how it had like a compile phase and a runtime phase? Did you like that split? No hands. My hand's up, but only because I wanted you to do it. This guy's like, I kind of liked it. Right, because he did some macro shit. I see you. I know what you did. You walked that runtime thing and fucked with the array. I know you. OK. Um, and it was cool you could do it. But I'm not saying that it was a good idea. It wasn't. Um, people hated it. I wish I could have gotten rid of it, but I couldn't figure it out. And these guys didn't either. Um, real languages. You know, Wing is mostly TypeScript, except when it's not. That's going to bite you someday. Um, I don't know which day, but it will. Um, should you really have infrastructure as code here at all? I'm completely unclear why we care about having to specify the compiler backend and the cloud provider. You've already abstracted away Q. Just do it. Just make that thing happen. Skip this whole shenanigans of pretending you're going to generate infrastructure as code like it's going to integrate with my other infrastructure as code. We just watched Keith's incredibly good talk about infrastructure as code patterns. You're not integrating this shit in your existing Terraform repo. Yeah, that's dumb. It's not going to happen. So why are we doing it at all? Why not just make the calls and do it yourself? Yeah. OK. Um, let's talk about ChatGPT. Yeah? You sick of ChatGPT yet? Um, you will be. OK. Um, what's ChatGPT? Look, it's this big conversational AI thing that we trained on this huge portion of the internet, uh, which is awesome. It's also like a terrifying hype demon that's coming for your jobs, your life, and all the fun in the universe. Um, it's Broco's Basilisk. Um, it's not at all open source, so sorry, uh, but it's just not, so you're going to have to deal with it. I asked ChatGPT what it is. It gave me a pretty good answer. Um, I think the important part is it's designed to understand and generate human-like text based on the input it receives. And that's what it does. It's quite good at it. Um, prior art to ChatGPT, this is Eliza. Um, this is the first AI chatbot I ever used. Uh, it was designed to be a therapist. Uh, so I pulled up Eliza as I was prepping this talk, and I, it said, hello, I'm Eliza. I said, hello, I'm Adam. And it said to me, did you come to me because you are Adam? <laughs> and I was like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like a little I did. <laughs> Um, so I think it was pretty good even then. Um, another thing that's sort of prior art here is Spam Assassin. How many people use Spam Assassin? Yeah, fuck yeah, Spam Assassin. Saved us from spam. Amazing. Right, machine learning thing. Trained on a huge corpus of all the spam. We ran it for decades. It's what kept your inbox clean. Spam Assassin. Get some. Okay. Um, <laughs> AWS. Um, look, Amazon, I'm using this for search. So if you really think about similarity search and faceting, the earliest versions of this really were things like this, where I said, give me red sweaters with faces on them. And so it gave me a thing of red sweaters. This one has a face. It's not a sweater, but whatever. It's got faces. Um, and then this is a sweater that comes in multiple colors. And then they understood that sweaters had different facets that you might care about. For example, crew neck sweaters, long sleeve sweaters, right? And you could like pick between them. That was cool, faceting. Also cool. Google, take all the data ever anywhere and throw it in a search engine. Right? Good idea. Um, hot dog, not hot dog. Um, this, I think, honestly, was the pioneering thing that led us to ChatGPT more than anything else. Because how many of you installed hot dog, not hot dog? Yeah, not enough of you. You can't install it anymore, which bums me out. But there was a minute where everyone in California had hot dog, not hot dog, and were taking pictures of everything, being like, is it a hot dog? And you were like, it's not a fucking hot dog. Anyway, um, OK. So what's it like to use ChatGPT in real life? So I, thought, I was trying to think of, like, what's the thing I could do to show what it's like to use ChatGPT? And I thought, this crowd will appreciate Chef, so let's do that. So there's an OG Chef tutorial that basically lets you create users in databags. So this is the conversation I have with ChatGPT. I said, I have a server running Ubuntu. Uh, use Chef to write me a recipe that installs Nginx and Postgres, make sure all the packages are up to date, uh, and has a user atom with an SSH key I can log in as. And it just did. It was like, sure, no problem, homie. 
and it wrote the recipe exactly the way I would have written it. Um, might have taken it away. The only problem was it decided my shell was bash. I don't like bash. So I said back to it, Adam prefers to use ZSH. Can you do that? And so make sure it's installed and change it. And it was like, absolutely, no problem, homie. And it rewrote the recipe, set my shell to bash, put a little comment in there that says, Adam likes bash, right? <laughs> Good call. Um, but it did have like a small logic bug, which if you're an order nerd, which I am, I'm like, hey, you referenced ZSH, but we hadn't installed it yet. That would bother me till the end of time in this recipe. I would just be like so angry about it. The puppet people are like, this is why you need dependencies. But if I'm not a fucking puppet person, I'm the chef guy, and so I don't like it. And so I was like, hey, can you just do that before the user gets created so I'm happy again? And it was like, absolutely, right? And it puts it right at the top. It's like, first thing we do, <laughs> install ZSH, because that's what you gave me, the, told me to do. And I was like, this was awesome. What if I wanted to get my SSH key uh, from a data bag? And it was like, no problem. And it like writes the code again and it fetches my SSH key out of a data bag. Here it is, right? And then drops it off. And I was like, this was amazing. Hey, instead of doing that, could you just iterate over all the users in the data bag uh, and install their SSH keys and then show me some JSON examples so I could populate the data bag? And it was like, no problem. And it wrote the recipe perfectly. It gave me a little example. There's even a user that has ZSH and a user that knows, uses Bash because it knows I care, right? Because it loves me, right? And then it did the right thing. And here it is. It's like, hey, grab the bag, walk the bag, make the users, done burger. I cannot tell you how, many, how much time I spent writing this tutorial in like whatever, 2006, right? It was like a minute. Uh, and this thing just did it and it was amazing. So I then was like high on my own supply. I was like, chat GPT, this is my fucking new best friend. So uh, part of what happens inside of uh, system initiative is it's a big graph. I'll talk about it in a minute, but it's got a table that's called edges. And uh, I needed to write a recursive query against the edges. And how many of you know how to write recursive CTEs from memory? This guy, one guy, that's your guy. If you need to do it, homie's got you. I don't, right? I know it exists, I've done it before in my life, but it's not things that I remember. So I gave it my table structure, I asked my question, I was like, tell me what to do. And you know what it did? It wrote me the query and explained how to do it. And when you ran it, it mostly worked. It was like a little wrong, but way less wrong than Google would have been, right? So again, I'm like, this thing, genius. Love it, let's go. So then I thought, let's give it the hardest thing I can remember <laughs> ever being having to do with Chef, which was install SAP HANA. How many of you have ever tried to install HA HANA? Yep, one guy back there. How'd it go? It worked, he went like this. <laughs> right, exactly, it fucking worked, right? Um, okay, so here's the thing. Uh, I asked it, I said, hey, can you, because I was so confident, I was just like, can you write me a chef recipe to install a highly available version of SAP HANA? And it told me to go fuck myself. <laughs> um, it was basically just like, look, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna do all this research about how to do this incredibly hard thing, then you're gonna write a recipe, then you're gonna validate that you were right, you're gonna make sure it works repeatedly, and then you should think about things like security and backups and monitoring and documentation. <laughs> Here's some code, um, you know, install the packages and go fuck yourself. Um, and I was like, oh, you know, I read on the internet that sometimes if you beg, it'll do it anyway. <laughs> so I was like, could you do it? I know you can, try. Um, and so then it wrote like a longer winded version of telling me to go fuck myself. Um, essentially like an angry developer would do. You know what I mean? If you're like, could you just, I know you can, could you just try harder? You know, and they're like, well, you'd have to do all this fucking hard stuff. And then when you were done, it still wouldn't work. Um, which is literally what it said. So, you know, it has limits. Um, but what it does do is let computers be creative, which is honestly, fucking incredible, because that's not a thing they could do before, and now they can, and that's awesome. And it's really fabulous at helping me with things I know but don't remember, or to check my assumptions about the things I already do know. So if you wanna know how it works, Stephen Wolfram wrote an incredible thing called What is ChatGPT Doing and Why Does It Work? You should go read it, it's really good, I'm not gonna give you that summary now. Instead, I asked ChatGPT to explain how it works and to generate some slides. Um, so essentially, it works by taking in a huge amount of data, the internet, slurps it all up, right, in comes the training data. 
Then it transforms it into coordinates in 3D space, right? If you were sitting here for Patrick's talk, you saw him talk about this. There's an array of vectors. It's basically saying this thing sits here in space. Then it takes your input and it does the same thing. It maps it across that space. It goes, you ask me a question. I'm going to look for all the similar things in the 3D space of all the information in the internet. And then I'm going to choose what the next basic token, character, what, what have you, would be. So then it generates a response. And that response then comes into the evaluation loop. So it's basically referring to itself as it goes. So as it starts to write the little chef recipe, it's like, well, I know I'm writing a chef recipe. And what's the most likely next thing for the chef recipe? And like goes along and along and along until in the end, it pops out something that's like pretty, pretty rad. So look, um, ChatGPT, hugely better than Googling. Um, and if you do one thing in this talk other than talk to me after this presentation about what you think is cool, it should probably be get a ChatGPT subscription. Uh, it'll make you more effective at what you're already great at, and who doesn't need that? Um, OK, so where are the sharp edges? Because there's always some. Hallucination. Uh, this is less of a big deal than you think. Um, everybody loves to talk shit about hallucination. I did too. I was like, this AI thing hallucinates. You can never use it for infrastructure. I sounded smart. I don't know why I made an accent there. I think I need to apologize, but I'm not going to. OK, so um, it's the source of, of, of much of what makes it amazing and unique is that it can hallucinate. If it couldn't hallucinate, it couldn't be creative. If it couldn't be creative, why do we care? Um, but it is going to get things wrong. Uh, it is going to make things up, and that's going to be a bummer. Uh, the hype is a problem. Uh, this is like actual transformational technology. It's very cool, but we treat it like impenetrable metaphysics, right? If you listen to some people talk about AI, they're like, it'll do everything ever. And you're like, well, what about the science part where it has limitations? They're like, no limitations, more power. LLMs will run the world. And you're like, no, they won't. It's a fucked up search engine. OK. Um, <laughs> the last thing is blind faith. Lots of people, you just throw stuff at it. It's pretty good all the time. You know, its only real value is, an, is as an adjunct to the knowledge you already have. If you don't already know the complex thing you're asking it to do, this thing is going to lead you straight to doom. <laughs> Just bad, bad, so bad, right? Um, so, you know, everything it does requires interpretation. You're going to have to think about it that way. If you use it to augment yourself and your team and the things you know, amazing. Change your life. Uh, if you're like, I don't know how to program SQL, so write me a recursive CTE, that's going to go so badly for you. Um, OK, similar art. Uh, Pulumi has a thing called Pulumi AI. It's basically rebranded ChatGPT. If you just want like a ChatGPT that only talks about infrastructure as code, you can get it from Pulumi. Um, Bard, this is Google's version of ChatGPT. It's just worse. So maybe don't try. Um, I asked it the same question. It just got it wrong, like twice. And I was like, mm, nah, pass. Um, Copilot and Cody. So these things use your code base, and they generate the prompt for you, which is cool. Um, but it's kind of annoying. They like uh, tell you to do things all the time that you maybe don't want it to do. Just you have to remember, it doesn't replace your expertise. right? So having more of the data at its fingertips does make it easier for you to ask more interesting and complex questions without having to craft them yourselves. That's cool. The part where it's like better autocomplete, kind of annoying. OK. Um, woof. Possible future research. I mean, we haven't really applied a lot of the thinking around vector databases and proximity search outside of AI. So that's really the only place we do it. I think there's a bunch you could think of here that's really interesting. We have all this data about compliance and security and auto. You know, what would happen if we inferred the security policy rules? I don't know, but I think it'd be cool to find out. Um, we don't have like a Wolfram for infrastructure. Um, if you haven't used Wolfram Alpha, it's, it understands math, and it knows how to do things. So when you ask Wolfram, like, where's the next solar eclipse, it's not like looking it up from a database. It's doing the physics and then telling you the answer, which is amazing. Um, but we don't really have that for infrastructure. And without it, we're not really going to be able to tie something like ChatGPT into a system that's going to be able to do things, because our domain is finite. It's a little more like math. If the configuration's wrong, it doesn't work, for example. So we've got to figure out what that is, and we don't know. Um, the last is, you know, the frontiers here are around like world models, reinforcement learning. How does the system know when it's right or wrong? If it's making a guess, how would it know if it's the right guess? Um, it doesn't have a real understanding of what is or what's possible, which means net new things are going to be a challenge. Um, this is why if, you're, if people tell you it's going to take over the everything, not yet. <laughs> not without some more uh, development. 
Um, I'm basically in Jan LeCun's camp. If you're not following Jan LeCun, you should be. I think he's basically right. Um, okay. Whew. I need to shake it off. That was a lot of talking. How am I doing for time? You're good. Okay, good. Um, let's talk about system initiative, yeah? Yay! Okay. Um, I cheered for myself because I was nervous. Um, that's, that's what happens sometimes. Um, system, system Initiative is a collaborative power tool uh, designed to remove the paper cuts from DevOps work. Uh, it's fully open source. There's no proprietary code at all, anywhere, at all. So you can take it, do what you want. Uh, system Initiative is open source. Um, yay! Thank you. Yeah. Um, OK, so prior art. Uh, I mean, obviously, Chef, Puppet, CF Engine, all the principles of configuration management, that's my jam. That's where I have come from. It's where I feel most comfortable in, in my professional life. So all of those things are, are, are embedded in, in what System Initiative is. Um, another source of inspiration is Unity. So Unity is a platform for building video games. Um, and essentially, you can think of this as a single, very complex workflow, building video games super complicated, requires a bunch of people working together with different disciplines uh, over a long period of time iteratively. Sound like anything you know? <laughs> the chuckles. It sounds like DevOps. Okay. Um, oh. oh, yeah, exactly. Um, they have different interfaces with different, for different jobs, right? So if I'm programming in Unity, it looks like an IDE. If I'm doing 3D modeling, I'm using a 3D modeler. If I'm doing scene construction, that's slightly different. If I'm doing blueprints for other people, it's slightly different, right? It's not one thing, it's many things for all the different people involved in the work. Um, so we drew a lot of inspiration from things like Unity. Um, another is Figma. So Figma's real-time design um, and really clean multiplayer interactions. If you've never used Figma with another person in real time, you really should give it a go. It's pretty epic, um, and it feels incredible and very different than what you've done before. We drew a lot of inspiration from Figma, both for how it looks, because it has this very, I think, very discoverable user experience, but also how it feels uh, when, you're, when you're doing it together. Um, and then Terraform and Pulumi and the infrastructure as code crowd. Um, obviously, we drew some inspiration. I also think, you know, in terms of art being in conversation, they clearly drew inspiration from the prior generation, right? Like, the way those tools work is roughly the way that Chef and Puppet and CF Engine worked, just now they do it on APIs instead of doing it on servers. Um, okay. So, what's it like to use System Initiative? So, basically, it's like drawing an architecture diagram. So, but the architecture diagram actually builds all the infrastructure as code and manages it for you. Um, so you start out with an empty canvas um, and you make a new change set. So you can think of a change set as like a git branch. You can see that kind of up here. Is that too small to see? But there's like a little change set hiding up there. Um, and then you pull assets over here from the left and you drop them onto this canvas. Um, and then when you draw connections between them, what you're really doing is configuring them. So, you know, in an architecture diagram, you're just sort of drawing a relationship between them and going, this thing uses that thing. In system initiative, there's, you're actually inferring configuration relationships is what's actually happening in, in the diagram. Um, you can then also set attributes manually. So some things don't need to be inferred. The names of things is a good example that is almost never better to infer. Um, but then there's these little hexagons uh, that turn green uh, as you work. So they start out red, and then as you configure things, they turn green. And what's happening is we're making a little simulation, right, of that asset, and we're checking to see if that thing would work or not. So it's basically hypothetically looking at it and going, is this good or is it bad? Um, so we can give you really fast feedback loops, right, rather than thinking about having to deploy it or do it or do like a plan to see if it would work or to apply it to see if all the actual configuration was right, we can just tell you sort of in real time. Um, now, what this does is basically deploys an instance to EC2, right? So it's not, it's not all the most complicated infrastructure in the world, um, but it's very quick to do. I've probably made this infrastructure in System Initiative, I don't know, a thousand times. It takes me about 25 seconds um, to just be like, boop, 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 boop. Um, if you know what you want, it's incredibly faster than infrastructure as code, right? If you imagine even cutting and pasting a snippet of infrastructure as code to do this and then replacing the variables, like, there's no question uh, which one you'd rather probably use. 
So then when you're done uh, making the architecture or when you're done with whatever the piece is you're working on, it'll then tell you uh, what changes it needs to make to AWS uh, or to whatever cloud provider or whatever thing is that's sitting underneath it in order to do what you ask. So you can think of this like a built-in plan. And the difference is that we're computing that plan in the hypothetical space as you go. So instead of having to like run the plan process and it takes it and then looks at the cloud and then does the thing, what's happening here is that we're just computing it sort of as you go. And you can specify which actions to take yourself if you want to. So it's a little more iterative um, and, and it figures out the right order, but you can tweak the order, you can decide to um, put things in or not. So for example, down here, it's telling us it would create the key pair. If you were like, yeah, but I don't really want to create the key pair, key pair right now. I don't know why you would decide that, but you could. You could hit that little X and then it wouldn't actually do it when it, when it comes time to hit the apply button. So then you wang this little button here. Um, that's a term of art. Um, the apply changes button. And what happens is it'll go out and actually apply all those changes to AWS. So it'll go create all the things that you asked for in this particular case. Um, and it'll do it with as much parallelism as the configuration allows. So it's looking at this big graph and it's going, well, the first two things that have dependencies are they don't have any dependencies are the AWS key and the security group. So we'll create both of those. And then in a batch, we can then create the ingress and the instance rule because they, they require the data from the key pair uh, and the security group, right? Um, the loop is pretty short. So this loop between uh, deciding like this is what I want and then letting the system go see it um, is pretty awesome. It's kind of, it's, it doesn't take nearly as long as like a Terraform plan would do or an apply, certainly than a plan apply cycle or a full code review cycle. As a result, when we see people using it, they tend to do things more iteratively. So rather than like in infrastructure as code, you might write all the code and then try all of it at once. Here it's more like, yeah, let's bring the server up and then you would see it. And then you'd be like, great, that worked. Now let's do this. And then you'd apply it and then that would work. And then you just keep going as you do it that way. Uh, and you're not losing any of the benefits of infrastructure as code. It's all there in the model. You could recreate it if you wanted to. We can cut and paste it and all that stuff. Um, okay, that's cool. But if this was all it did, um, you'd be like, that's fun, Adam, but it's a toy, right? Um, and the reason it would be a toy is because it wouldn't be programmable enough because all of you have complicated infrastructure. How many of you feel like you have in your application or your infrastructure or whatever it is you manage, it has something about it that's relatively unique to your problem? Raise your hand. Most of you, <laughs> exactly. And so in those moments, you've gotta be able to go off the rails and color outside the lines. And so we let you do that too by essentially embedding a programming language. So everything that happens in system initiative uh, is essentially the result of a JavaScript function, TypeScript function. Um, and you edit them from within system initiative itself. So on the screen right now, that's the code for the Docker image that we used in the earlier example. Um, that's what defines the asset. So it basically says, here's all the properties, here's all the different ways you should display them, here's how they relate to each other. Um, and you could then create your own. So you can create brand new assets from inside here and then iterate on them and play with them in the UI. Um, you can also add other things. So you could extend how assets work. So you could be like, in our organization, Docker images work this way, not that way. Or uh, you could change how things work directly. All that stuff just works. Uh, it's completely extensible by the user. Um, there's really kind of nothing that you can't do. I love this loop um, because it's a little like small talk uh, or like Visual Basic had like a weird infrastructure focused baby. Um, from within the infrastructure, you can change how it would behave and then see that happen in real time, which is super fucking cool. Um, so here's an example of adding a qualification. So what this would do is just check that every Docker image in our infrastructure uh, starts with the phrase config management. I don't know why you'd want that, but if you did, you know, maybe you have a rule that's like, we only pull from our internal Docker registry, right? So you could write, what is it? 12 lines of TypeScript. And what it would do is then apply that to every Docker image immediately every time someone used one. And so suddenly that policy would become that little hexagon, right? It would go red and a developer would be like, pull it from the public registry and it would stay red, right? Because, and it would tell them why. It'd be like, can't do it. You gotta put that Docker image in the custom registry, right? Um, 
On the right hand here is an integrated test panel. So what you're seeing us do here is take this code and we selected the specific Docker image asset that's in the infrastructure and we just tested it. We said, what if we applied this function to this input resource and it told us it would fail, right? I love this flow. It's so cool. Um, it's, it's so much quicker than having to pop in and out of like writing the infrastructure description and then writing the policy and then putting them together, right? Instead, we've mashed it up so that they all happen together in one place in the same change set at the same time. Um, this is System Initiative's production infrastructure. Um, it was made collaboratively um, by three different people, including Paul Stack. Um, they built it together in real time. So one of the coolest things that I've seen in the last year was we were in Discord and we had the three people who were building it um, all sort of frame, I have 10 minutes left, thank you. Um, I didn't have to say that out loud. <laughs> well, uh, nine minutes, 40 seconds. Okay, um, uh, yeah, so it was collaboratively made uh, by these three people working in real time. Each one of them is building different parts of the infrastructure at the same time. So if you looked at their screens, they weren't looking at each other, they weren't screen sharing, they were just working in the application in multiplayer. They could see each other's cursors, they knew where each other were, and they were putting different parts of the infrastructure on the canvas at the same time. Um, and then would iterate really quickly between it. So they'd be like, hey, do you have that subnet group? And he'd be like, yeah, I finished that. And he's like, oh, I got the ECS task, I'll connect them. And so now the subnet group was flowing through uh, to the particular ECS cluster, which then allowed the IAM rules to get written, right? And all that stuff just sort of flew together. Honestly, this was fucking incredible. It was a complete revelation. The last time, I've been a systems administrator since I was 16. The last time I remember working with someone that way was when Nathan Haney Smith and I worked at an ISP in Arizona and everything was servers and we would just sit next to each other and be like, okay, you type this and I'll type that. It was awesome. It was so good. Because we kind of forgotten that you could do it. How many of you have ever collaborated, spent your whole day in collaboration with another systems administrator in real time? Yeah, most of you, which is great. You want to do it more though, right? If you could, because it's more fun with other people. Um, and it, it really does let you do it. Um, you know, no code review necessarily. You could do it. The apply kind of shows you what the code is. It shows you what changed. But all the same security that happens from pipelines uh, that we now sort of encode and process, we just sort of encode it into the product so it gets out of your way. Um, yeah, uh, there was no setup either. So if you think about adding a fourth person, all they would have to do is log into the workspace and they could just start working. Uh, just join the change set and go, um, which is pretty rad. Okay, how's this work under the hood? Um, you wanna get nerdier than this, yeah? yeah? Okay, that's what it's like to use it, but here's how it works. So basically, it's this big hypergraph uh, whose values are defined by functions. And it's easiest to understand sort of in one dimension, although it is happening in, in n dimensions. So, you know, basically what happens is we have this Docker image, which is defined by some schema. So it's got like a bunch of properties, right? And you can think of them as a big tree. Um, every element in the tree is attached to a function. Um, and that function runs in like Firecracker, basically. There's a big Lambda-like execution engine that runs it in isolation. And then compute takes the value and stores it in that position. So for example, when you type in like, here's the name of my Docker image, we have a function that also sets the image name to the name because we discovered that almost always when you type the name of the Docker image, what you're really typing is the path that you want in the registry. So we just infer that value. So how that works is you would type in the property root si name, which is the name of the component. That would then call a function called set string with the string the user passed. That would then automatically trigger another function, uh, which is root domain image. That function gets called set string with the value of root si name, right? So whatever the name is set to should do it. That then computes the, uh, walks up the tree. So it says given that value, now go up one level and compute whatever it should be. And in this case, it should be a key in an object, right? So it's gonna say the key is image and the value is an object. If I zoom in here, you can see, right? So now that level is image system init whiskers. So then, that pops over here, right? Meanwhile, we set the name here, popped up a level. So now the value of this is name system init whiskers, and then it pops up a level, and now it's si name is system init whiskers, the domain image is also system init whiskers, right? So it's this big recursive function execution machine 
that understands how to take arbitrary inputs in a giant configuration graph, right? So if you think about prior art and things you could sort of think you could steal from, like this idea that all the configuration is a single enormous graph that can be reactive to its inputs, this is a good idea. You should steal it. Um, so for something like a qualification, um, it works exactly the same way. So part of the power of this as a fundamental primitive is that we can build anything this way. So when we want to qualify a given component, what do we do? Well, we make a function called a qualification. So we build a property, qualification property. It has a function attached to it, which is the code that we wrote earlier in the little editor. Um, and we say that that function should run anytime the domain data has changed. So we call the specific data about your uh, component the domain. Uh, and so anytime that changes, we rerun that function. So if we zoom in, this was the function we told it to run. We change the domain image. That eventually rolls up to the full domain. I've put people to sleep. I'm so sorry. Um, and what it then generates uh, is the results, right? So it now ran the qualification, writes the results. We then take that thing out. We can show it to you in the UI, um, and you move on. So we call it a hypergraph because each change set, you can tell I made this with ChatGPT. I don't have the artistic skill to actually do any of that. But essentially what happens is each change set allows you to set new values in isolation. So it'll carry over from what the values are in head and then it'll push them to the back. So we keep track of all that stuff over time, right? So that you can uh, actually hypothetically have a bunch of different versions of the infrastructure all at once. So when we say it's a power tool, that's, that's what we mean. It's literally that you can model anything you want inside of it. You can customize anything you want with it. You can extend the system in all sorts of new and interesting ways. The world is in fact your metaphorical oyster. Um, so honestly, it takes everything in my power not to do what Drew Barrymore is doing right now. I can't cross my eyes. But like, I wrote this thing and I've been in the game a while and I know that I'm supposed to be demure. I'm supposed to be like, it's pretty good. You should take a look at it. It's fucking sick. <laughs> it's fucking amazing what this thing does. It's so cool. Um, and look, it's not like perfect yet. It's got shenanigans and I'll go through them here in a minute. And like, it's gonna take a minute to make them perfect. But what this thing does, it's the best fucking art I can imagine making. It's so good. It's yummy. It's yummy and delicious. And today, it's the worst it will ever be. It's only going to get cooler. And I freak out all the time. And it's like a problem for my family. You know, like I walk in and I'm like, it's so cool. Look at the thing they made it do. And they're like, could you shut up already? And I'm like, no, because I'm vibrating with how cool it is. It's so cool. I'm so excited for the future. Thank you for letting me indulge. I promise next time I'll be demure. Was that 10? I'm being like pulled off the stage. No, you're not. You're not kicking off yet. OK. We have time for questions, but he's not done with I'm not done. Oh, Jesus. Although that's a good ending. Look, I'll skip to the end because I'm literally, clearly being yanked off. Let's, look, there's sharp edges. Let's go a couple. Performance isn't where you need it to be yet. There's not a ton of integrations. There's only 56. They're all AWS focused. People hate click ops, so they see that visual composer and they're like, this thing's a toy. It'll never work for me. I hate your stupid face. I get it. I do too. It's not click ops, but it is better. It's much faster. You should try it. Uh, and it's very much early adopters. And so if you try to use this thing and you don't know what you want or you don't understand what's happening, it's probably going to cut you. Um, but you're in this room, so you're probably in the group that it's fine. Um, similar art, there's a thing called Brainboard, which generates diagrams from infrastructure as code, has some multiplayer stuff. AWS has a thing called App Composer, generates Terraform, uh, HCL, for, uh, not even. It generates cloud formation for you. And then Mass Driver, which is another thing that basically says you should do this, only it should be a developer portal. Um, so it's like basically you take all the stuff you would normally do, you slap a developer portal on it, but it gives you a UI that kind of looks like a diagram. Um, yeah, okay, look, possible future research. What else can we model? We can model anything in system initiative. And if you think about everything being a reactive graph and what that means for the changes in your workflow, it's super crazy. So like, what about your build process? What about CI CD? Why do we have a pipeline? Don't really need a pipeline. I could just detect when the code has changed and then I could react and call another function, which compiles the code, which then runs the test, which would sort of be like a pipeline, but might be better. 
Um, different views for different things, right? So security, compliance, cost, telemetry, all that stuff could just be functions. Health checks, what's monitoring but a reactive function to the state of the outside world, right? Um, so that's cool. So look, thank you so much for listening. I'm so glad that you're here. I love being here. I love talking to all of you about it. Please come talk to me about the art that you think is amazing. Uh, and, uh, and I hope that you feel a little inspiration from, from these examples and we find some more. Thank you so much. I want to leave you with this Rick Rubin quote. He said this, as I was getting on the plane, and I thought it was the perfect ending, art isn't in the tools, material, or equipment you use, it's in the way you see the world. And so if you want to make great art, what you have to do is constantly look at the world and bring in those inputs and make cooler stuff because of it. Thank you. Now I'm done. Thank you. I thought you were doing it. Thank you, Mr. Adam. Uh, we're going to all vote. Should we give them some chocolates? Yeah. All right. Now we're uh, So we have uh, time for maybe like one demo. Really quick <laughs> question or demo? Yeah. Every day, I mean, for the whole conference, I want you we'll to be here. Like, hey, are you Mr. Adam Jacob? Can you please do a demo next time? And if you all do it, it'll be a huge DDoS. It'll be very funny. Okay. Okay, here's a quick demo. Uh, check out cut and paste. Control C. Control V. So what's cool about that, now think about the production environments Keith showed you earlier. So what it would do is strip the resources off the end. It'd be like, oh, this is a new thing. So it's not the same as the thing you had before, which would then allow you to say what it needs to do is create a brand new one. And then it would automatically go red because, for example, like you'd be reusing the same subnets. And so it would just go red and be like, oh, don't do that. You better change those. And so once you tweak them and they turn green, now you have a production environment. Ta-da. OK. Is that my time? Thank you again.